Okay, guys. So, a couple of things that have um, been consistent, I would say, from examining all of your papers now, all of your um, practice paper twos on the use of props in street combat and the birthday party. These, I would say, are the, are the most distinctive things that need a little bit m more work. And I would, I would say, in many cases, um, it's only really minor changes that, that need, in for most of these things, that need um, adjustment. The introductions, I think, still need a little work at digesting the prompt a little more clearly. You know, in many cases, some of you are are rephrasing the prompt back in, in, in an assertion, but what you need to do is, is articulate very, very clearly what it is that the prompt is asking you to do so you can pinpoint um, before you even start what it is that you're going to go on to do in your essay. And that involves both components of the prompt. In the, in the one that you've just done, what many of you focused on was obviously the use of symbolism, but a lot of you didn't mention very frequently the second part of the prompt, the effectiveness, how it enhances the effectiveness. What that means is how is it contributing to the meaning and the drama of the plays? And you've got to make that very, very specific. And I would say it really needed discussing in terms of the audience reaction, as does really everything in a, in a paper two essay on drama. You know, you need to be constantly talking about the way drama is created in these plays and the way audiences will react to it. No, it's, it's vital that you do that. And so that second part of the prompt is a really important thing that I would say was consistently a little bit a little bit more missing in many cases in your answers. Secondly, and this wasn't very many of you, but a few of you did, instead of outlining comparison ideas, you outlined individual ideas in streetcar in the use of props and then individual ideas in the use of of props in the birthday party and then tried to sort of broadly summarize the different the, the similarities and differences at the end what you need to be doing is, is coming up with a single comparison and defining that comparison then moving on to the second comparison then moving on to the third comparison obviously you can you can give a broader sort of abstract sense of a comparison like in your many of you said you know the, um, for example the props were used to establish a sense of banal um, ordinary reality and then you can develop that by going into a little bit more, uh, basically recontextualizing it in terms of each of the plays. You know, in Pinter, it um, Pinter uses the the everyday prop of the cornflakes to establish the banal rituals of both behavior and language that lie beneath the or, or that shroud the distance in in our relationships with one another and our sense of self. Whereas in Williams's play, the the statuette that Mitch returns with after his date with Blanche reveals um, the failure of outsiders to adapt to the norms of uh, romantic behavior. That's what we mean by recontextualizing. Then ending with a comparative thesis statement, I would say this was almost entirely absent in all, I would say in almost every single introduction and where it was present, this was often missing. So this is still something that we need to work on. Now these are not huge, huge um, they don't hugely affect the marks that you get in, in this particular paper, but I think that the lack of them reflected in further absences throughout the body paragraphs that did have an impact on your grades. And I would say this prompt part is actually one of the major, major flaws that needs tweaking. It's very minor, but very significant in terms of where you end up on that rubric. Now, body paragraph one, you need to begin every single first, you know, when we say body paragraph one and two, I mean the first of two comparative paragraphs where you're establishing the first writer's handling of a, of a particular genre convention. You need to begin that with a clearly defined contrast or connection and then move on to that, that specific writer. So every first paragraph of, the, of a comparative pair needs to define a connection. Then you move on to the first writer. Also importantly, what, what was missing, I would say this is the most consistent flaw that needs addressing, is responding to the subtlety in the prompt in every paragraph ending before shifting to the comparison. 
Very frequently, this is only a case of one or two sentences. You know, in this case, it was the effectiveness of the plays. And that, that, that vocabulary and the, and the response to that, you know, the audience reaction, the way it contributes to drama and meaning was missing, basically, in the section after you've dealt with all the details and their significance before you move on to setting up the comparison. And that final thing I would say is cueing the comparison with the second writer at the end of the first one. That, I would say, this isn't a major, major problem, but it's something that just makes it so explicit what you're doing. It makes the comparative nature of what you're doing extremely, extremely explicit. The second body paragraph, the main thing, I think, again, was that subtlety of the prompt and then a direct comparison of writers' approaches. So I'm just going to quickly take you through now a number of different um, parts from your essays that, that showcase actually many of the good things that were going on in your essays and then a couple of spaces where there was need for development. So this is Luca's introduction. And, and what's highlighted is his, first of all, in blue, his response to the prompt, and then in green, his outline of the comparisons. And then what's missing is this final comparative thesis. And I think all of this together makes for a pretty close to perfect introduction. In Streetcar Named Desire and the Birthday Party, both playwrights, Tennessee Williams and Harold Pinton, make use of props to enhance the effectiveness of the plays. You could say a little bit more here, Luke. You could go into actually how this is carried out, you know, by revealing a correlation between their protagonist visions of reality and by um, um, explaining how they relate to the power hierarchies between antagonist and protagonist. Further than this, you can say, this question is asking me to examine the way in which props are used by the playwrights to support their wider thematic concerns, something along those lines. That would be enough. Or how props are used to um, create a sense of drama to which the audience responds throughout the plays. That's what we mean by responding and digesting the prompt, because what that's showing us is that you've understood the importance of this effectiveness part. And, and, and Luca's essay, I would say, is very good at this. It, it clearly does consistently respond to that subtle component in the prompt. Then he very well, he, he very clearly outlines three very clearly defined comparisons through the use of props and the way the audience perceived their use, the view of reality adapted by the player's protagonist is revealed. Then the ordinary and ritualistic habits of everyday life are exposed as meaningless actions used to mask the emptiness of the individuals and their inauthentic, I think that probably should be inarticulacy, or their inauthentic articulacy. I wasn't quite sure about that particular word, but um, their inauthentic use of language would probably be a little bit more accurate. I mean, this is accurate, I would say, for the birthday party, but perhaps not for um, streetcar necessarily. Just a little unsure about that, but still, it's a very well-defined idea. This is again exposed to the audience with the use of props on stage. So again, it's this constant use of the dramatic nature of the play and its language that's particularly good. Furthermore, the theme of power and how it is exerted among individuals is also portrayed through the use of props and their significance of the characters of the play. So you could probably just omit that final part of the sentence. Then this is the part that is missing, I would say, in it, almost every single introduction. And when it is that case, then it's, uh, you know, I, I take responsibility for it. I've obviously not communicated this clearly enough to you. Just like every other essay, you need a thesis. But in this essay, it needs to be comparative. So this is the type of statement that I would be expecting to find in a really good introduction. Williams' prop use is characterized by an expressive style that exposes the distance between his protagonist's aesthetic vision and the brutal materialism by which she is dominated. Pinter, however, makes use of props in order to reveal the way in which we shroud the emptiness at the center of our lives. Both writers then make use of props to expose the ways in which their protagonist experience difficulties when trying to negotiate reality. There's the, you know, you've you've... Distinctive feature of one, distinctive feature of the other, and then that central shared connection or contrast it can be. That's the really the, the central point of this particular essay. So that's what we're looking for. Just to show you another example, you might want to pause here because this is an example that has most of the elements. You know, it, it does respond to the prompt, but it could be developed, I think, in order, you know, what you can articulate here. This is Umberto's. In this opening section, actually, the part they crossed out is useful, but the opening section could here, again, say what the question is asking you to do. It's asking you to explain how props contribute to the, the thematic significance of the plays and the drama that they create. Then, again, he very clearly defines 
three very well specified comparisons and again that thesis statement is missing from this particular introduction so that's all I want to say about the intros the first thing I want to look at then is the beginning of a comparative pair so this is the first bit of a, of a, of a pair of comparative paragraphs actually from Luca's essay and there's a number of things that are good here it reads, in both Harold Pinter and Tennessee Williams again make use of props to enhance the effectiveness of their respective plays. So again, it uses the language from the subtle component of the prompt. Props to enhance the effectiveness of their plays. Then, both playwrights reveal the empty ritualistic nature of ordinary events with the use of props. So this establishes a clear comparison between the two writers before defining the approach of writer one. So I've got a sense of, okay, both of them do this. Okay, and now I'm going to move on to Pinter. What does Pinter do? Harold Pinter uses cornflakes as a prop in the beginning of his play in order to, and I think he goes on to say, establish the banality of everyday rituals or something along those lines. But that process, language of the prompt, comparison between the two, writer one, that process is a really good example of how to usher in your ideas whilst handling both the plays and then shifting gradually onto the first writer. And this is what we're looking at, actually, is how to um, add to what he's done. You know, Lucas scored very highly on this, but he could have scored even more highly, I think. You know, his, his essay is great. And, and what you can see if you read this section, which I'm not going to read to you now, but you can pause the video and take a look through it, is a fantastic range of supporting details. You know, there's a, a number of different points. You know, we've got, I think, four or five different details from the text. Very sophisticated commentary on their significance. And it's very well handled. It's very fluent. Now, what I would do just before setting up the comparison, which is what I've written here at the bottom of this paragraph, is respond to the prompt subtlety. And Luca does this quite well in many places through his essay. Um, but this is actually one place where it's missing. And it is more natural for it to be missing in the first of the two comparative paragraphs. So all this would take is literally a single sentence like this. This enhances the effectiveness of the play because it encourages the audience to understand the sense of alienation between the husband and wife before Stanley arrives and exacerbates that difference. You know, we've got, okay, weird tension between husband and wife and then, oh, look what happens. Uh, a kind of weird Oedipal son figure emerges and occupies the space between them. So what we then would move on to, that that's responding to the subtlety in the prompt because it's talking about the tension that's created. Often when we, we're talking about drama, we're talking about suspense, tension, conflict. Those are the three things that you want to be thinking about. How is the audience responding to suspense, tension, conflict? And those things, if you keep tracking that, if you're talking about the effectiveness of a play, that's what's going to allow you to respond to the subtlety of a prompt. Then it would be useful to just, with a single sentence, cue the next comparison. The alienating effects of ordinary rituals are also evident in Williams's play because it just keeps tracking through these paragraphs what it is that you're comparing between the two of them. And this is effectively to compensate for the fact that you're splitting comparison across two different paragraphs. Then how do you then adjust of the, the beginning of a second paragraph for comparison? So you've cued it by saying that it's in the previous slide the alienating effects of ordinary rituals are evident in Williams's play. Then what you would do, I think, is to adjust this to identify the subtle differences. So you've cued the similarity at the end of the first one, and then when you get to the second one, you're defining the, the, the difference. Where Pinter suggests our rituals of language and behavior are uniformly alienating, Williams reveals the alienating effects of romantic rituals for those who don't conform to society's expectations, characters like Blanche and Mitch. So you've effectively broken up that first sort of segue into a prompt at the end of paragraph one and then the, the, the contrast between the two of them at the top of paragraph two. So this then leaves the way to finish those second paragraphs. Now this is a really, really good conclusion to these two paragraphs. And this is the conclusion to Lucas' paragraph about, you know, the, the everyday prop in in Streetcar, the, the upside down um, statuette of Mae West. This part here is using the language of drama and theatricality to respond to the subtlety in the prompt. Therefore, the audience acknowledges that both Harold Pinter and Tennessee Williams use props to reveal the ordinary nature of our lives. 
which to some extent uncovers the meaningless meaninglessness of our existence. That's what we've got in both of these playwrights, and it's really well defined in the dramatic, the language of drama and theatricality, which responds to the effectiveness of the plays. Then at the end, there is a direct contrast in approach. While Pinter has an approach directed more towards criticizing the inauthenticity of certain individuals, Williams examines how some individuals are not capable of relating since the only way they can mask the internal tension between them, the awkward tension between them is by performing traditional rituals. So you've got a very clear sense of the distinctive approach of both of these writers. Now, you could say something slightly different in both of these cases, but we've got, okay, both of them say that banal activities are meaningless through their props, but while one is... Um, criticizing inauthenticity of just certain individuals the other is trying to actually mask tension between them by performing rituals so there's a, a slight difference between the two of them and that's what gives us the the sense of the clarity of the comparisons and the connections that you're drawing between the two plays <laughs>